board president of Sea Glass Theatre Company. Welcome to another in our continuing Spotlight series. Today, we introduce you to Thatcher Harrison, guitarist and composer extraordinaire. We hope you enjoy it. Thatcher, please know how much we appreciate you doing this with us today. And Sea Glass feels so privileged to work with you. Your skills on your guitar and with your composition and just what you do to bring music to the world is something that we very much appreciate you sharing with us. So why don't you uh, tell me a little bit about where you grew up and how you got immersed in your music. Where I grew up. I should know that, shouldn't I? <laughs> Unless you're not grown up yet. <laughs> fair point, fair point. Um, I grew up, um, I was born in Florida, but I grew up in a town called Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Uh, moved there when I was five. Uh, I lived there full time until I was 17 and moved up to Boston to study at New England Conservatory. And since then, um, I've divided my time between Boston during the school year and Dartmouth uh, during the summertime.
Why guitar? What? Wh how did that all happen? You know, that's a very good question. And I'm afraid that I'll have to give you a somewhat boring answer. The fact of the matter is, I don't remember how I got into the guitar. I've been told that I started playing guitar when I was, sources differ, but I've been told that I started at either two or three. But my first memories of my own life are at three years old, and I was already playing guitar by that point. I wasn't playing well. Uh, one could make the argument today that I still don't. But um, but the honest truth is, I know a lot of people, because you know they'll start at a slightly later age, they remember what it was that got them into it. I have no idea. I've been doing it for as long as I can remember. Oh, that's amazing. No, that's actually quite wonderful, because it means it's just part of who you are, doesn't it? <sighs> Um, that whether it's a good thing or not depends on who you ask, but yes, it's yeah. definitely a part of who I am. Yeah. How about the composing? Uh, composing came in a little later. Um, I suppose technically my roots in composition, uh, stem from the fact that growing up, going to open mics when I was, you know, five years old, most everybody there wrote songs. Uh, they were songwriters. So I kind of, in contrast to a lot of people who grow up in a classical music community where um, trying to um, write your own music or improvise your own music at a young age is oftentimes discouraged, um, I was actually brought up in an environment where, if anything, it was discouraged if you didn't. So I don't think, in terms of my compositional development, if you will, I didn't write my first piece that I would be willing to play for you now until I was about 13. And I don't think I got to the point where I would consider myself a truly a guitarist composer on basically equal level until um, equal level in terms of dedication, not necessarily skill. I'll leave that to other people. But um, I didn't get to that point probably until I was about 16. So that came a little later in life. So the concept of walking up to an open mic at the age of five blows my mind. I mean, did, did your parent, I mean, how did you know that you should go ahead and do that? How, was it a teacher that influenced that or your parents or how did that happen? From what I've been told, and I think I vaguely remember this, I would set up in our living room, I would set up stuffed animals and play for them. So I think that was sort of the idea that my parents had, maybe if he likes doing that so much, we should actually get him in front of people. Um, so that started when I was about five. I, I don't think I would have come up with the su suggestion because, you know, as a five-year-old, I didn't know what an open mic was. Um, but, you know, do you want to play for people? Sure. One thing I also want to clarify is that a lot of these things, of course, if we talk about my earlier years will come, you know, I will oftentimes have to say my parents sort of came up with these ideas, but they never forced me to, um, to play music. Um, they said I could quit at any time if I wanted to. The only condition that they ever placed, and I'm glad that they did, was that if I wanted to perform, because when I went to open mics when I was five, I loved them. They were basically, for a period of my life, they were basically my raison d'etre. Um, you know, they were the, you know, the, tr the trying days of preschool and kindergarten when I thought there was no hope. Uh, I would look towards, you know, that Friday night or that Sunday afternoon. And um, so those were kind of the reason to keep, you know, those were the happiest moments of, at my, in my life at that time. Um, so in order to do that, my parents said, if you want to go out and play, you have to practice. Um, but, it, but if at any time you want to stop, you can. So I'm not one of those people who was forced to play. It was simply a condition of 
if you want to perform, you have to practice. And I'm very grateful now that that, that was the case.
New England Conservatory has three principal departments, classical music, jazz music, and CI, or contemporary improvisation. Mm. As I mentioned, I'm not a classical musician in a sense of the word. I can play classical music, but it's not how I identify, it's not how I see the world. And at New England Conservatory, for, for instance, just this past semester, I went from appearing with, now this was unaffiliated with NEC, I performed with the Harvard Radcliffe Symphony Orchestra as a classical guest. Um, and I, I appeared with the Symphonic Winds, again, as a classical player, but I was also in the New, in the New England Conservatory Jazz Composers Workshop Orchestra, which is one of their big bands that premieres works by young composers. Um, I got to play in the gospel ensemble where my role was sort of as like a session guitarist. And then of course, those were in the jazz department and in CI, I can be in, you know, a West African ensemble. And New England Conservatory really does encourage, if you have the will to do it, they won't stand in your way of you trying to branch out beyond your department. I like to tell people that I'm a classical major in name only. I love that. The breadth of everything available there is amazing. When, when, when you go through, well, Boston to begin with is a great place to be in the music business, if you will. But the sure. breadth of what you just described, the opportunities, it, that's, that's just incredible. It's kind of like thinking about your, where you've appeared. You've appeared in Carnegie Hall. You've done competitions and all these interesting places. How do, how do those connections get made, Thatcher? Do you have, do you look into, do you look for those opportunities or do they come to you because people experience your, your gift, if you will? I think it works both ways. Um, generally speaking with competitions as a general rule, um, the player looks them up, you know, sees what's out there and tries to find the opportunities that way. Um, so I think especially, uh, you know, even competitions aside, be it concerts, anything like that, I think the way it usually starts is that people, or I'll just speak for myself, I don't want to speak for anyone else, they might have different experiences than I have, um, but I think a lot of the times when you're starting out, it's mainly looking for the opportunities because they don't necessarily know who you are, and then once in a while, if you, you know, prove yourself and do well and people like you, then and opportunities start to fall into your fall into your lap. So at this point, I'm still kind of in, and I think we should always be in phases where we are partly looking for things, partly getting things coming to us. So in my case, I would say I'm very fortunate to have uh, both in my life right now, and I'm very grateful for that. So. Let's talk a little bit. Let's change the, the feel a little bit. What do you do in your downtime? Do you What's downtime? Down <laughs> we said it at the same time. Do you um, have downtime? <laughs> um, one of the things that I've had to try to do, and honestly, it kind of comes and goes. There will be periods where I'll have some more, periods where I'll have some less. This happens to be a period where it's a little less. Not that I'm complaining. It means that you're getting work. Um, which is always a good sign uh, for people like me who are a bit more freelance. Um, but in my spare time, I am a huge baseball fan. Um, I find it, I'm, I'm not going to lie because there are some things where I won't share my opinions. I'm okay to share my opinions on baseball. If the way the game was played today was how it was when I started watching, I wouldn't have become a fan. Uh, too many strikeouts. But... Uh, but um, I am still a, a devoted baseball fan. Um, I've had a rough life because I have grown up, as I mentioned, I'm a Massachusetts guy, and I've been a New York Yankees fan for my whole life, which uh, it, it's basically, in, in elementary school, it's basically like walking around with a kick me sign on your back. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. I've been fortunate enough that they've given me, despite the fact that they haven't won a World Series since I became an active fan, uh, they have given me some wonderful moments. And they've given me thicker skin because if you want to, uh, if you want to convince a room of Red Sox fans that it's okay to be a Yankees fan, you better have some factual information up. I love anything food related. 
if I angled the camera down, you'd be able to see that a little more. So I do love watching uh, cooking shows in my spare time. Um, I'm not a particularly uh, active participant, but I do love watching. Um, awesome. And beyond that, I enjoy, you know, taking walks, having very good conversations with people um, and just um, having fun and enjoying life. But one of the beautiful things directing it back to music is that there are definitely elements of playing music and writing music that can feel very much like a job. But every time I get into some kind of a creative rut and I question, is this really what I want to do? Whenever I consider any other options, all I can come back with is the fact that I'm so grateful to do something uh, that really does give me um, a deep sense of um, uh, satisfaction. Yeah, it's wonderful.
your most memorable performance? Oof. Well, there are many that come to mind. I'll give you one. Uh, so the last one that I did was a couple weeks back. It was right during uh, the final exams, final projects period at New England Conservatory. I had, for a variety of reasons, pulled four all-nighters in a row. I hadn't slept in four nights. Also, I hadn't picked up my guitar in that amount of time because, of course, if I had amount, you know, if I had time to sleep, I would have had time to practice a little bit. But I was completely underprepared to play a concert. Um, I hadn't, you know, typically I try to practice steadily, um, even if I don't have a concert, and all the more so if I do have one, you know, because mm -hmm. I want to be ready for anything. But I hadn't touched my guitar in a long time. I got in like a 15 minute warm up right before my car was the, the car service was going to pick me up and take me to the venue. So I did that. I warmed up a little bit and I got to the car. And as they're driving me to the venue, I'm basically like this. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> my eyes were just shutting involuntarily. Uh -huh. And I actually looked over at uh, the driver and I said, if it's all the same with you, I, cause I didn't want to look anything less than professional. Yeah. Um, so I said, if it's all the same with you, I think I'm just going to close my eyes for a moment. So I, I did that for probably about five minutes. The drive ended all too soon. I get out of the concert and I'm just, I feel absolutely like a wreck. And right before the concert, I, I go into the restroom to, you know, freshen up and make myself look presentable. But I was so tired that I wasn't actually watching what I was doing. And I slammed the door. Bam, and I caught my hand smashed by the door. Now that woke me up pretty quick. So that was a good thing. But then the concern was, am I even going to be able to play? Because I could barely move my hand. And so... And I was kind of thinking, okay, well, if I can't play my hardest stuff, you know, what can I do as a substitute? Like, you know, all these things that you have to think about last minute when something goes wrong. Yeah. Um, but eventually I, you know, I did a couple things. Um, you know, I got a little bit of ice and I decided, you know what, I think I can go. So they introduced me. I go up and play a concert. I kid you not. On four straight days, no sleep, having not picked up the guitar having just nearly broken my hand, I might well have played the best concert I've ever played. Amazing. Amazing. I, I, I don't even know how it happened. You must have crashed after you got home, like, big time. Well, actually, I couldn't because finals weren't over yet. I did one more. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> but but af after, that, after that day, I got a 13-hour sleep, and that... that did the trick. One thing that I'd love to hear a little bit about, I have not ever heard of classical fusion compositions. Did I get that right? Yes. Yes, you did. Tell, um, me, what, tell me, you know, I've heard of fusion food, so I'm thinking maybe it's a little bit similar, but Tell me what if, classical if, if you looked down below this part of the camera, you would be able to know that I've experienced fusion food. There's as fusion well. there, <laughs> and, and non and non fusion food, just any type of food. Uh, <laughs> you, you, uh, this camera angle is wonderful, isn't it? Um, the music, I'm playing a classical instrument and using a lot of playing and composition techniques that will often be found in classical music, but from there, I can incorporate influences from jazz, from the blues, from rock, from fingerstyle guitar, film scores, uh, you know, different types of world music, whatever really I want to incorporate can all come in. And one of the wonderful things is, you know, for example, in my recent concert programs, I might start by playing my arrangement of uh, the prelude from Cello Suite Number no. 6, BWV 1012 by Johann Sebastian Bach, which is a piece from the Baroque era. And Bach, of course, was a, a Baroque era composer whose style was largely Renaissance based. So that in and of itself covers that. But then I might go into playing one of my own pieces called Broken Ale Blues, which, mm -hmm. as, you can which as you can tell from the title, uh, is kind of in a blues aesthetic, but it follows a jazz composition form. It involves percussive fingerstyle techniques played on a classical instrument. 
From there, I might play a ballad that was written, you know, with influence probably, you know, largely from, you know, jazz ballads, but also with, you know, counterpoint ideas that I would have taken from the Renaissance period uh, or melody lines that would be perhaps inspired by Romantic period classical music. Uh, and then, you know, I might play a piece that's inspired by re reggae or, so or soul music or anything like that. So it's basically taking a classical instrument and playing music that has roots in classical uh, classical techniques. And then rather than trying to shut out other genres, welcoming them with open arms. And what I'm trying to do is take the things that I like best about each of these genres and kind of make them into my own voice. Wonderful. It's wonderful. So last question. Sure. What do you hope your future holds? Don't throw away today looking for tomorrow. Um, and I think I've made that mistake a few too many times. I've thrown away a few too many todays in either anticipation of or in fear of what will come tomorrow or in subsequent days. But to answer your question, what do I want out of my life? Of course, yes, I want to uh, play and write music for the rest of my life and hopefully make that my living. Um, but I suppose uh, to be happy, that would be one. Uh, if possible, to live as long a life as possible. Um, and to try, people have asked, uh, one of the questions that people will oftentimes ask uh, people is what's, if you could have a superpower, what would it be? And a lot of people will say like flying, or a lot of people would say to be invisible or to be immortal or any one of these things. And they're all good, great choices. I wouldn't fault any of them. But, it, but I thought about it and I thought, what would my superpower be? And I think if I could pick a superpower, I would love, I don't have this power now, but I would love to have the power to be able to make every person around me happy. Now, the wonderful thing is, as I mentioned, I don't have that power, but being a musician is the closest thing to it. So if there, as I mentioned, if there's a through line in this interview, it is that I'm such a lucky person. And one of the reasons 
is that I am fortunate to be in a position where one of the primary objectives of my job is to make other people happy. I mean, what more could you ask for out of life? It's pretty wonderful as far as I'm concerned.